right. Um, I told Karen I wasn't going to do this, but I think I am. Uh, some, some folks were a little troubled by chapter 16 last week because the language is so explicit. I think the reason is shock value. I think that's what exactly what Ezekiel is trying to do. He is trying to be gross <laughs> to talk about what is the symbolic nature of your idolatry. And uh, so we've talked before about his term for idols. I don't know whether you remember that or not. Repetition is the soul of education. It's used a few times elsewhere in the Old Testament for idols, but it's, it's Ezekiel's favorite term, gilulim. And it's from a root. Hebrew is built on three consonant roots, and that has something to do with round or roll. Another noun made from it is waves. Rollers. That is a round thing. The round things left in the road when a horse goes by. If I may follow in the path of Ezekiel, You want to worship those things? Go ahead. My, my. Our idols. The things we tend to worship in place of God. So, much of the writing, again, it's not always clear, but much of the writing, the Hebrew is very elegant. He is a gifted writer. But every so often, here is this gross kind of thing that he brings in on purpose to try to shock them and us into thinking about the reality of what we're facing here. The ultimate uncleanness, if you will. And there it is. All right. That said, uh, my reason for choosing this hymn tonight is precisely because of the content of chapter 18, where Ezekiel talks so directly about what is righteous and what is wicked. And I want to talk about that in some detail. So what are they saying by their use of that proverb in verse 2? The parents eat sour grapes, the children's teeth are set on edge. What do they mean? What are they talking about? They are blaming their ancestors for their situation. It's because our grandparents, our great-grandparents, our great-great-great-grandparents were so wicked, we're suffering. Poor us. Yep. Very good. You can be my straight man anytime. Before I get there, I want us to go to 2 Kings chapter 24. We've talked about this history uh, again and again, but it's important. 2 Kings 24. And verse 4, uh, verse 3, excuse me. Surely these things happened to Judah according to the Lord's command 
in order to remove them from his presence because of the sins of who? Manasseh and all he had done, including the shedding of innocent blood, for he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and the Lord was not willing to forgive. Okay, remember? <clears throat> Manasseh was the Davidic monarch who ruled in Judah between roughly 690 and, five, and, and 640. 50 years. He is the son of Hezekiah. Probably the second best king Judah ever had. He had a son named Ammon who ruled two years. Six, literally, he's, he finished in 642. 642 to 640. Before he was assassinated. And his infant son, seven years old, Josiah, was put on the throne under a regent, a priest, and he ruled from 640 until 609. Now this guy, so Hezekiah is good. Manasseh is awful. Ammon apparently was following in his own footsteps. Again, we don't know why he was killed. My guess is it was political. But anyway, he was killed. So the Bible says he followed in his father's footsteps. So we'll give him that same grade. Josiah is probably the best king ever. Then he is followed by, we'll talk about this especially when we look at chapter 19, Jehoahaz, who interestingly is 23 when he comes to the throne. He lasts only three months till the Egyptians take him out. He is replaced by his brother Jehoiakim, who is 25. So in other words, this is not the oldest son. <laughs> he is replaced by his 18-year-old son, who only rules three months before he surrenders, and as far as the Bible is concerned, this is the last Davidic monarch. He is replaced by another son of Josiah, Zedekiah. He is an appointee of the Babylonians, and he is, you might say, <laughs> Partly because he's just weak. This is the real bad guy in the middle of it. But now anyway, anyway. So, here comes, he's going to rule from 598 till 586. And then, Jerusalem is going to get destroyed. Why? Because of Manasseh's sins. Well, this fascinates me because I've written a commentary on Kings that is somewhere in the publishing process, if Oswald will get moving. Uh, a lot of commentators will say, well, this is just God's sovereignty. 
God doesn't care that there was a big revival under Josiah. Too bad. They've already done it up here, and it's over. Nothing that happens. Well, number one, number one, Jeremiah, who was the prophet from the time of Josiah, looks like 626 until uh, sometime after the fall, let's say 580. Jeremiah, speaking for God, has many calls to repent and be delivered. In short, it's not all over. Well, what does the Bible mean then when it says they are going to be judged for the sins of Manasseh? They're going to be judged for the sins of Manasseh because apart from this blip on the screen, they have duplicated Manasseh's sins for a hundred years. Manasseh has set some things in motion that this doesn't really change. It's, it's again, <laughs> I made a discovery when I was working on this. Josiah stands in front of the temple between those two huge 40-foot pillars, and he renews the covenant. He promises he will keep God's path. He will walk in God's way. And the text says the people stood in the covenant. Now your English Bibles will say they renewed the covenant. That's not what the text says. Typically, when you make a covenant, you cut it. <laughs> and, and there's a lot of discussion about what that's about. I'm not going to go into that now. But that's the technical term. They cut a covenant. They swore to the covenant. These people did not do that. They stood and watched Josiah renew the covenant. And if you read then the things that happened, the cleansings that took place, every one of them, Josiah did it. And the people are not stopping him. But the instant Josiah is dead, bingo. And if you, I hope you remember, remember chapters 8, 9, and 10, the description of what's going on in the temple in Ezekiel's day? It's this stuff. So, why are they judged? Well, because of the sins of their ancestor, which they have cheerfully joined in. Okay. All hearts clear there? <laughs> now, let's go back to Exodus which I think is what my brother was raising there. Chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. Verse 6, Exodus 34, 6. Is either directly quoted or alluded to eighteen times in the Old Testament. It's directly quoted six times, it's alluded to another eleven. Eighteen times. One of the most wonderful verses in the Bible. The Lord, the Lord, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, Abounding in steadfast love. 
forgiving thousands of, I better be sure I'm quoting it correctly, wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Stop right there. Oh, goody. He's a patient, forgiving God. Wonderful. I think I'll live like hell for the next 40 years, and then I'll repent, and God will forgive me, and I'll go to heaven. Moses says, read the next. There are consequences of your sin. If you choose to be a drunkard, your children will suffer. Now we read punish and we see this picture of God saying, okay, you sinned, I'm going to make your kids miserable. We've talked about this before. <laughs> primary cause, secondary cause, tertiary cause. Is God causing them trouble because of my drunkenness? Well, yes. That's the way he's made the world. But is he personally, intentionally saying, I'm going to hurt them? No. If you choose to commit adultery, your children will suffer. Because God wants to get them? No. Because you sinned and there are consequences. Now the good news is maintaining love to thousands. Jot this down. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Thousands of generations who keep his covenant. If you will keep his covenant, God says, I'm starting a process here that could go to a thousand generations. Isn't he good? He limits the effects of our sin to only three or four generations. But the effects of your righteousness, if they will follow in it, again, there's no Automatic guarantee here. But something is set in motion that will make it possible for a thousand generations of faithfulness. My heritage is Mennonite. And somebody, I suppose it's a Mormon, has done the family tree back to 1543 which is about when the Mennonite faith begins. Wow. Wow. I counted, I, I think it's 14 generations. When they got to this country, they saw the light and became Methodists. <coughs> <laughs> of faithfulness. So, we say, what a mean God. We're going to punish those children to the third and the fourth generation. No, what a gracious God who's going to limit the consequences of my sin to three or four generations. So, once again, I become an alcoholic my son becomes an alcoholic. In the light of Ezekiel, he cannot say, well, I'm being punished because of my dad. No. There's one cure, one sure preventive for alcoholism. Don't take the first drink. So yes, my son may well be prone to alcoholism because of my choices, but he doesn't have to do that. And that's what Ezekiel is talking about. Yes, yes, Manasseh, Manasseh, 
built a track for us. But you have chosen to run on it. That's what he's trying to aim at. That none of us can say, well, it's not my fault. I mean, he's writing to 21st century Christians. I'm a victim. I can't help it. Ezekiel says, get a life. <laughs> yes, is there some proneness in you? Because of things your ancestors have done? Yes, probably so. Mm -hmm. The devil made me do it. Yeah. But you do not have to, by the grace of God, walk out that proneness. Josiah is an example, a classic example. If there was anybody who was prone <laughs> to go to the devil, <laughs> it was Josiah. But he didn't do it. Again, it's, it's just the, the story is so beautiful. Hey, hey, King Josiah, we found an old book in the temple when we were renovating it. Oh, yeah? What's it say? Let us read it to you. Dear God, is that who we are? Is that what we've done? Is that the path we're walking on? Have mercy upon us. And all the angels in heaven sang. And if the nation had responded as Josiah responded, they wouldn't have gone into exile. But they didn't. They stood in the covenant. Well, if you want to do that, go ahead. We won't stop you. We don't believe that. And when I'm preaching for Pete's sake, don't fold your arms. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Did I get to it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Precisely. So what is, if I'm trying to understand you correctly, what you're saying is, is if every person, and not just like the two ways where it's most used, but in this case, there's a proclivity that things will point us to, and we, but we still have a choice to go down that, that way. Exactly. And there's a grace to choose the other option. Exactly. Just like Hosea took the grace, the people did it. You got it. You got it. Give the man a gold star. <laughs> yes, that's, that's exactly what I'm saying. That, uh, no, we do not have to walk out a path that may have been marked out for us by our ancestors. We don't have to go there. And that's, that's what Ezekiel is trying to drive home here. And, and in his typical fashion, he drives it home. <laughs> so, let's do it. I, I was going to put it on the uh, overhead, and then I decided, no, no, let's, let's do it. What are the qualities that mark a righteous person, and if they're missing, a wicked person. So you can start there at, um, well, not in Exodus. Uh, you can start at 18. You can start even earlier than that, I think, uh, in terms of, of uh, I think you can start at verse 5. Okay, and what? He does what is just and right. Now, I think that's a kind of an introduction. I think that's a general statement that's going to cover the particulars that are coming up. What's the next one? He doesn't eat at the shrine. He is not... An idol worshiper. All right, what's next? Does not commit adultery. 
Um, okay, Let, all right, we're doing negatives. All right, we'll do that. Uh, no, I want to do positives. <laughs> Faithful to spouse. Yep. <laughs> All right, what's next? Okay. I want to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Next. Okay. All right. We'll do a negative there. Does not steal. Next. You know, generous giving. All right. Next. You got it in front of you. What does it say? <laughs> he avoids injustice. Avoids injustice. And is that the does not oppress? Yeah, yeah. It isn't? Okay. All right, what comes next? Okay. What's the what does it literally say? What's the concrete? Okay, okay. Yes. Is that it? Okay. All right. So there it is. So there's the one that was uh, let's see, where's the a love avoids injustice and lives without intent or with interest. He lives without interest. Yeah, okay, I think that's this generous. So that would have been well, that that was the and generous. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay. All right, all right. Again, what is it? He lends without interest. Lends without interest, yeah. And coupled with that then is not oppressive. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there it is. You want to know what kind of behavior God approves? There it is. We might say here, content with what he has. Yep. I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content, whether it's Kentucky or Michigan, either one. <laughs>
What is the testimony of the Old Testament with regard to this? With regard to this. <laughs> Is it off? Oh, okay. Testimony of the Old Testament is this is our goal. We're trying to live this way. But there's something wrong. You gonna do this? They say, sure. No problem. Why wouldn't we? And five weeks later, they're dancing around a golden calf, praising it for having delivered them from Egypt. Karen? Are you turned on? Well, that's part of what he was struggling with. <laughs> All right, I'll talk louder. <laughs> So, if we can't do this, what are we going to do? Oh, oh. And thank God we don't have to try to do that anymore. That's what a lot of gospel preaching is these days. Yep. Now, yes. Yes, I mean, I'm over here. You gotta try. But, but all the time you know you can't. But thank God. God looks at us through Jesus colored glasses and he says, Oswald is the most righteous guy I've ever seen. And the devil says, Are you talking about the same Oswald I know? <laughs> I heard you in the in the beginning on the right track here. What is grace for? Now I'm going to have to write all this again. <laughs> <laughs> grace is that we may be able to live this kind of a life. Grace gives us, as Bonnie said, a desire for this kind of life. Grace does not wipe out the commands of the law. Grace enables us to live within the bounds of the law. Grace frees us for righteousness, not from righteousness. Wonderful. Grace frees us for righteousness, not from righteousness. And this, of course, is the pattern that is established immediately in Exodus. God saves them by grace. Why did he bring them out of Egypt? Oh, because they're such righteous people. No. He brings them out of Egypt because he loves them. Why? No idea. <laughs> then, 
he brings them to the foot of Sinai and says, Would you like to walk with me? Would you like to share my life? Would you like to share my character? <clears throat> and they, like most They don't know they've got a problem. They don't know that there's something in them that says, yeah, that's all right. But first of all, I want my way. So, let me be as, as clear as I can. Yes, these are the standards. And God hasn't changed his standards. This is what he wants for me. This is what he wants for you. That we can be trusted with other people. Notice, virtually all the rest of these, after those first two, all the rest of these have to do with how we treat other people. Let me live in a closet and I'll be the most holy man you ever met. It's just having to deal with people like you that makes it so <laughs> difficult. <laughs> there it is. Can I be trusted with other people? Or will I use them for myself? Now, I want to talk about this one of returning pledges. Uh, that was what I referred to. Uh, my, my, my own. Oh, it was all the way up there. Question three. Oh, I had it carried away here. Exodus twenty two twenty six, part of the stipulations of the covenant. Exodus twenty two twenty six. So I'm a poor man, and. I want you to lend, lend me some money. Now, you're a good man, so you're not charging me interest. But, you're saying to me, well, Oswald, I need some collateral. I need a deposit. And I say, This is all I got. Would you take that? And you're a first kind person. You say, that'll do. That'll do. Now look what it says. Exodus 22, 26. If you take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, return it by sunset. Because that cloak is the only covering your neighbor has. What else can they sleep in? When they cry out to me, I'll hear, for I'm compassionate. Isn't that interesting? Come sundown, I go to your house and say, here's your coat. And you say, well, I don't have the money to pay you back yet. That's all right. Sleep in this tonight and give it back to me tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's the idea there? What, what's underlying this? Don't put them in bondage. Don't put them in bondage? Compassion. Compassion. Compassion and trust. Compassion and trust. This is not just about a legal deal. This is about people. The New Living Translation there says merciful creditor. Yeah. 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 So when it's talking about returning the pledge, I don't think it's just that uh, you could. Again, we've got a deal. You've borrowed money from me. You've given me some sort of a pledge. Now you pay back the loan, and I keep the pledge. <laughs> It may be referring to that, but I think it also has this in mind. Now, 
I want you to look at a real barn burner. Amos chapter 2. Hosea, Joel, Amos. Find Daniel, then Hosea, <coughs> then Joel, then Amos. Read verses 7 and 8. What chapter? Amos chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. They trample on the heads of the poor as on dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. So not only do I not give the guy his coat back, I take it with me to the temple and lie on it with the priestess while we have sex together. Wow. Wow. Once again, he is linking worship of false gods and unjust living. They go together. We heard a, a good message in the seminary chapel today. <clears throat> and the, the preacher talked about the fact that most of us have really bought into the prosperity gospel. We say we haven't, but in fact, in fact, why do we serve God? We serve God to get. And when we don't get, then we say, why in the world would I serve him? Now, folks, that's paganism. That's, that's just flat-out paganism. Why do I serve my idol in order for my idol to supply my needs? Well, if God's not supplying my needs, <laughs> why bother to serve him? Could be because he's God. <laughs> Could be because he's died for you. Could be because he's entered this world with you. And though he doesn't promise to deliver from suffering, he does promise to share it. That's what the cross is about. The cross doesn't fix this broken world. What it does do is demonstrate that God is in here with us. In the end, in the end, to deliver us. But along the way, The hand that holds ours is a nail-pierced one. So, the guy who pleases me, the woman who pleases me, does what is just and right, avoids idol worship at all costs, and therefore can be trusted with other people. You see, if we know that our lives are in God's hands, we don't have to be grabbers anymore. We can become givers. 
But everything hangs on that issue. Am I an idol worshiper? And is my worship of God essentially pagan? I call it slot machine religion. I plunk my silver dollar in, I pull the handle, and God, sooner or later, gangbusters. Our speaker said to us this morning, and, and this is unquestionably correct, the mass of 20-year-old nuns, that's not N-U-N, it's N-O-N-E, when you ask them why, they will say, a good God couldn't have made an evil world like this. A good God could not allow you pray. So there is no God. Again, I can say this to you because you love me, but it's paganism. I will serve God as long as he produces for me in my way. It also, of course, is to miss the fact of the fall. This is a ruined world. This is not the world God made. It's a wreck. And the amazing thing about God is that he did not say, the amazing thing is he said, I'm going to step into this train wreck with you and help you through it to the end. That's a good God. That's a good God. So, all of that out of Ezekiel 18. <laughs> I think that scripture, in this world you will have tribulation. It doesn't say you might. It says you will. <laughs> and when I talk to people who are going through hard times, many times I'll share with them, I'll say, Christ has promised us in this world we will have tribulation. In this world, we will have tribulation. It's a promise. But be of good cheer. Yes. Yes. And this is, uh, you're so kind to let me do all this. This is the note I wrote myself in the, uh, if I can master this machine here. Joy is not the absence of suffering but the recognition that the eternal God is with us in the suffering. This is what Jesus is about, entering into what it means to be a human in a wrecked world. Can we have joy? Absolutely. Absolutely. People ask me sometimes why I grin so much. <laughs> My first answer is, well, if God gives you a big mouth, you better use it for something good. <laughs> More than that is, I found the secret. I found the secret. Is it Pollyanna? There's no troubles? There are no problems? No. Big troubles, big problems. But he's in here with me. Woohoo! All right. Says all that in Ezekiel 18? Yep. <laughs> so verse 30. Therefore, you Israelites, I'll judge each of you according to your own ways, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent. Turn away from all your offenses. Now see, this is Ezekiel. By this point, Jerusalem is within 10 years of total destruction for Manasseh's sins. You, repent. Turn away from all your offenses. Then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourselves of all the offenses you've committed. Get a new heart and a new spirit. There's where the, the New Testament, the gospel, is coming in. We can't live that way, Ezekiel. I know. Get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, people of Israel? I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. Wow. 
All right. Anything else you want to talk about at 18? <laughs> Discoveries you've made? <laughs> this is your chance. Going once. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about 19. Two, again, of these pictures that he is so prone to do. Call them parables, call them analogies, whatever you want to call them. But describing the situation there, and he uses two. One is about a pride of lions. That's so interesting, isn't it? What are a bunch of lions? A pride. <laughs> And it's a mother lion. Because fathers are unreliable child carers, that's why. And the other one is vine. Here's the vine again. A lush grapevine or a useless, barren, empty vine. So the lioness, and we can probably say here that this is either Judah or more likely, the line of David. And there's a cub. Verse 5. He prowled among the lions. He was now a strong lion. He learned to tear the prey, so forth. Excuse me. No, no, no. I, I've got ahead of myself. Verse 2. She brought up one of her cubs. He became a strong lion. He learned to tear the prey. He became a man-eater. The nations heard about him. He was trapped in their pit. They led him with books to the land of Egypt. So there's the first cub, and that's Jehoahaz. Then there's this other cub, and he is a real man-eater. And he is Jehoiakim. And Jehoiakim is not directly referred to here. Verse 8, the nations came against him, those from regions round about, they spread their net for him, he was trapped in their pit, with hooks they pulled him into a cage, and brought him to the king of Babylon. They put him in prison and so forth. So that is Jehoiakim and Jehoiakim. So, is this what you're depending on for your deliverance? We got Lion of the tribe of Judah. Good luck with that. Your mother was like a vine in your vineyard, planted by the water, fruitful, full of branches because of abundant water. Its branches were strong, fit for a ruler's scepter. It towered high above the thick foliage. Now, I think it's possible here that this is Josiah. Again, it might simply be the line of David, but... If it is the line of David, I think you can say it's coming to its climax there. That's when the vine is at its most beautiful, most productive, towered high above the thick foliage, conspicuous for its height, for its many branches, but it was uprooted in fury. As I've said to you before, I, that's one of my questions when I get to heaven. What happened to Josiah? Um, did he indeed defy God when the Pharaoh said, God is telling me, don't attack me. God is telling you, don't attack me. That's basically what Chronicles says, is that he disobeyed the voice of God in the Pharaoh. I have a little difficulty with that. But, nevertheless, 39 years old, some ways. Again, it may well be 
that God is saying, son, you've done all you can. Come on home. But it was uprooted in fury, thrown to the ground. The east wind made it shrivel. It was stripped of its fruit. Yeah. Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim. Its strong branches withered and fire consumed them. Now it is planted in the desert, in a dry, thirsty land. I wonder if that verse 13 is Jehoiakim the last legitimate king of Judah, planted in a dry and thirsty land. Don't know, but I'm quite sure I know what's coming next. Fire spread from one of its main branches and consumed its fruit. No strong branches left on it, fit for a ruler's scepter. Who's that? That's Zedekiah. Zedekiah is the fire that is consuming the vine, what's left of the vine. So once again, if you foolishly, you Judeans, if you foolishly think that your Davidic kings are somehow going to save you, you are crazy. In fact, the king who is now on the throne, as I'm speaking to you, is consuming the last branches of this great vine. What's the hope for you? Repent. Repent and live. Stop repeating Manasseh's sins. That's the hope. Now, this is in the form of a lament. I mentioned in the introduction, the normal poetry in Hebrew is composed of two synonymous lines. And each line, ideally, is composed of three accent units. In Hebrew, that's three words, and each of those words is accent. One, two, three. Then, in, in the, this hardly ever happens because it's ideal, but here it is. What's that saying? He's the creator. And you said it in this way. One, two, three, one, two, three. Now, a lot of times, they love reversing the second one. The Lord stretched out the heavens. The earth was founded by God. A, B, C, C, B, A. And they, they love to play with that. Okay, that's the normal poetry. The lament is a three-two pattern. Da 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 da. Uh, so um,
3, 2. And it's called a limping meter. Da 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 So this is composed in that kind of a meter. It is also has very typical Hebrew words in it. <clears throat> Those typical terms show up here. The question is, and, and I we don't really have time to talk about it a lot. The question is, is this a mock or is it real sorrow? Isaiah 14, the famous one that is often taken to be the history of Satan, which I don't think is correct, is a mock. It is, it is talking about the death of an Assyrian monarch. And oh, how happy everybody is that you're dead. <laughs> the trees of the forest sing. You won't come down anymore. It's, it's a mock. You're dead and we're glad. This might be a mock. Ooh. Ezekiel may be saying, get ready. These guys are going to get it. Or it may be a real lament. I'm so grieved over what is happening to the line of David. And I think you could make a case for either one. Well, it's probably not going to be both at the same time. It's probably going to be one or the other. Uh, but, uh, so, but again, Ezekiel is saying, as he said a couple of times before, he's going to say it again, if you're depending on the line of David to save your neck while you're living like hell, good luck. Good luck. Because they can't and they won't. Okay. Anything else you want to talk about? <coughs> You're like the class when the bell has rung. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that because of the grace which you made available to the cross, we can walk with the Father. Walk in white. Walk cleanly. We can please you, Father. Thank you. Give us hearts that want that above everything else that want to see the smile of your favor. Thank you that you don't promise everything is moonlight and roses. Because we know from our own experience that would be a lie. But thank you that in everything, you, with all your gracious power, are ours to carry us through. Thank you, Jesus. In your name, amen. Mm -hmm.